thank you for coming and showing up today. And I'm excited to share some innovative information to help all of you transform the way that you teach so that students are better prepared for the NCLEX and licensure. So if you're out there, give me a Facebook wave. Let me know that you're there and that we're connected. And I look forward to the opportunity to share more information related to the topic of bringing active learning as it relates to case studies with your content. So I'm not quite sure that we're that we're live. I've not seen any uh, anything coming through here. I want to make sure that uh, everything is connected. So I want to kind of just uh, make sure that uh, chats are coming through and that everything is going through. So let me just make sure there's no technical difficulties here and that everything is is as planned. So let me just kind of, okay. So you know what, we are out there, we are good. So you know what, I wanted to let you all know that I had comprehensive exams last week. I was a little bit distracted because I had comps on Friday and I survived comps and I'm excited to let you all know that I will be graduating the end of, well, I'm not graduating, but I'll complete the program by the end of July. And what that means just very practically is that if you found these little snippets on Facebook Live helpful for you as an individual faculty, I, for the last several years, have been doing faculty development workshops around the country. And August is pretty open, but I do have limited engagement dates. And so if your department is interested in having me do a full day workshop, sharing tools and getting everybody on the same page, I want you to know that I have some limited availability and you can either put your name and email in the chat or simply just email me at Keith at KeithRN.com. I'd be glad to share more information. Now, if you've been with us for the last three weeks, you know we've been talking about infobesity and why it's the enemy of student learning because there's only so much that our students can learn and we must make time for active learning. And that's gonna be the focus of today's topic. But before we go there, in case you're brand new to the Facebook Live or you missed one or two of the sessions, you can kind of go back to my Facebook page, Keith RN, Think Like a Nurse. And on the video tab on the far left column, you can go to those links and you can catch up. But we're going to do three metaphors really quickly. Number one, for those of you who've been watching, what don't we want to do with this with as it relates to our content? We don't want to cover the content. And remember this is that, you know, as Pat Benner aptly used this metaphor, when you cover the content by just covering all the slides, you prevent your students from seeing what is most and least important. And that's important for a novice student because they don't know what's most and least important. They'll study everything as equally important when in reality, let's be honest, it's not. So don't cover the content. Number two, be a funnel. You as a faculty are a funnel of the knowledge that is coming in, that the thousands of textbook pages, we have to filter that's coming in, distill it to its bare essence. Again, kind of the mantra, deep learning of what is most important. That's our goal. Faculty, every one of you, you're a funnel of knowledge, bringing it down to that most important. Finally, we need to be a sponge. Remember this principle. Here is, I'm going to bring this into the camera. This is all the information in your chapter, in your PowerPoint. It's a combination of need to know and nice to know. All in that chapter, all in that content dense slide. You know what this is? This is the need to know. And you want to basically take that nice to know all the information, identify what is the need to know, and remember that your student's cognitive load is in essence like this, like this sponge. Now, how much do you think that this sponge can hold? Can it hold this little bit of deep to know and really absorb it and retain it well? Or can we just give them everything we got? 
and hope they get it. And remember, what's going to happen? You're going to give your students a shower. They're going to be dripping, and most of it's going to be on the floor after your lecture. And so the principle of cognitive load as a science of learning theory, there's only so much that your students can remember and retain to bring it to the knowledge of the base of the, of the patient bedside. So again, little is what you want, the deep knowledge of what's most important. And remember I shared last time that if Sally Kennedy has a great quote, if anything is to be remembered, not everything can be taught. That's worth writing down. I don't have a PowerPoint slide. I'm going to wait till I get to my case study, but the bottom line is write that down because it's powerful and quite practical as it relates to student learning. So I have a question for you all. What percentage, and I want you to use this in the chat. I want you to chat up because I want to see what's going on. I want you to know what percentage of your classroom lectures do you implement any form of active learning that requires application and brings clinical realities to your class? Now, be honest. I mean, you, yes, your name's behind it. I'm not going to be looking for you, and nobody else is. But I want to know. I want to get a sense. How are we doing out there as nurse educators, as, you know, that, that, that bringing that active learning is a foundational paradigm shift to what we must do how are we doing collectively? We can learn from each other. So I would love to see what percentage are you bringing the active learning? And we're all on a journey. We're all on a pilgrimage, kind of getting to, kind of stair-stepping. I want to know where you are in your journey. And so Alice says 25%. Thank you for sharing that. Denise is at 60%. Excellent. Um, Tonya is at 75%. Wonderful, 25-ish for Bailey, lecture then case study over the content. And yes, I want you to know, Bailey, I am a fan of the, of the scrambled classroom. Will you kind of highlight that deep knowledge in about 20 minutes? That's what I've been talking about the last three weeks. Then make it active, apply it right away. 50% um, and 50%. Uh, and so Bailey admits we need to improve. No worries, Billy's at 50 and eaten alive. I'd like to know more, Billy, what that's about. It doesn't sound like your students were loving the active learning because how many of you know our students regress as adult learners, do they not? They should be loving the active learning. That's androgyny, that's adult learning theory, but they sometimes regress. Misty's at 90%, well done. Well, what I want you all to know is this, we're all on a journey, but you know what our goal is in the classroom, and this might frighten some of you, 100%. Every time that we teach as nurse educators, we've got to bring that context to our content. And I'm going to just briefly highlight Pat Benner's recommendations and her co-authors from Educating Nurses. But I want to set a, law, I want to set a high goal, and I think it's a high goal and I want you to know it's realistic because I did it as an educator. When I became aware of some of the things I needed to change, I did it every time we taught, there was an active learning application, usually in the form of unfolding cases and other related clinical activities. And so one of my goals that I'd really like you to set for yourself, if whatever you're at, at 25, 50%, bring it up a quarter. Go from 20, you know, your goal is to go from 25 to 50% this upcoming semester. Give it a chance. And I'm going to share some different ways we can do that in the weeks ahead. You don't always have to use an unfolding case. But the bottom line is, is that our goal is 100%. And I'm kind of, you know, I, and that's where I'd like you to shoot for. And anything less than that is a victory. It's a thumbs up because you're not doing zero, which is where nursing education has been for too long. So I want to encourage you that. And we're going to talk about some of the grumbling of students at the end of this and maybe addressing some of the ways we can get our students to buy in. Because just as faculty need to buy in to flipping your classrooms, making learning active, making it real every time you teach and not spoon feeding every time, faculty need to buy into that. And many of us haven't. But you all who are watching, I think you're one of those. And so I thank you 
for all that you're doing, but our students need to kind of buy into it. So we need to kind of basically prime the tank with our students. And I'm gonna share some strategies that I did in my classroom that was helpful. So I'm gonna keep moving on here. But when we looked at last week, I'd like to know how many of you did the very difficult thing and put your content on a diet? You know, dieting is hard in the natural realm for any of us who are a little overweight. And I've put on a few pounds with this, uh, with uh, the kind of uh, staying at home more than, uh, than we'd like to. But the bottom line is, is that how many of you have taken the effort to really, I'm serious, addressing and eliminating infobesity in your content? I'd like to see how you're doing. And if you've had the chance, what has been your number? What have you brought your slides down to? Because again, whether we're teaching in the traditional setting or online, we don't want to, infobesity is something we don't ever want to go back to. And those principles of a practice-based lecture that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks and go back to that are where we want to be. And so the bottom line is continue to work on that, address that infobesity. And if many of you are wondering, there may be some who are new to Facebook Live, they're saying, who is this highly caffeinated dude? Well, I have a name. My name is Keith. And you know what? I've been a nurse for 36 years, since the age of 20, um, in a wide variety of settings. Most recently, ICU, ER, in the critical care float pool of a large metro hospital here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. But I'm a newer nurse educator who never left the bedside and innovated my content with bringing my practice lens into my classroom and all that I did and created numerous strategies to bring uh, paradigm shifts that were advocated in Pat Benner's work and her co-authors, Educating Nurses, A Call for Radical Transformation. And that's a must read. If you have not read that as an educator, make that a priority if you have time over your summer break. Because what Pat and her co-authors had to say, and I really want us to implement, one of the things that we must do as nurse educators is implement educational best practices, not just what's trendy, not what's the latest shiny penny in nursing education. We've been following those bandwagons for way too long. Even as a new educator, I've seen it. Three things, teach for salience or situated cognition, contextualize your content, integrate class and clinical learning, and emphasize clinical reasoning. That's it. And when you look at those strategies, you know what really captures the essence of those? When you look at active learning, what brings content? What brings context to your content? What brings clinical to class? What emphasizes the thinking and action of clinical reasoning at the bedside? Well, a very good unfolding case study should be foundational. Not the only thing you do, but foundational to your active learning repertoire as an educator. And so when you look at the benefits, there's some huge benefits. You know, case studies bring that context to your content and they bring that deep knowledge of what's most important. But one of the studies in the literature has shown that it even improves patient outcomes. And so let's make that a priority. And one article, you know, I'm all about giving educators great free resources there's one article I want you to write down that you can build upon the things that I'm sharing in the next 15, 20 minutes that you're gonna learn and grow from. Lisa Day was one of the co-authors of Educating Nurses with Pat Benner. And in, the cha- in one of her chapters, she did an exemplar of unfolding case studies. And she wrote an article, I do believe in the Journal of Nursing Education, but it's titled this, Using Unfolding Case Studies in a subject-centered classroom. 2011, Lisa Day, D-A-Y, just like it sounds. And I want you to make that, that is a powerful and practical article that's gonna help you get traction to build on what I'm sharing and go deeper in the literature and make it real. Again, using unfolding case studies in a subject-centered classroom. And one principle that Lisa brought up in that article Subject-centered classroom. You know who the subject is? It's the patient. It's all about the patient. And that's where, you know, our students are inherently self-centered, are they not? They are focusing on what nursing education, what, what it's all about me, what I can get out of it, that entitlement that can be present in some students. 
when our when we use case studies and bring a real patient into our classrooms, they begin to see that nursing is about the patient. That subject centered is the patient, and that's a powerful principle. And another thing I want you to look at when we talk about unfolding cases, it really is in essence, low fidelity simulation. It's bringing in the thinking without bringing in the skills lab or the clinical, but they are practicing and mirroring clinical realities. And you know, not all cases are created equal, but I wanna share with you what I've developed with my lens of practice um, as an ER nurse, I love ER scenarios because they're ambiguous. And so I'm gonna share with you um, a very powerful and simple, what I call skinny reasoning. Now skinny reasoning saying, Keith, why do you call it skinny reasoning? How many of you have heard of skinny cow chocolate? Skinny cow chocolate has all the goodness of chocolate and half the calories. Now, who doesn't love that? I love that. But with the skinny reasoning case study, it has the essence of an unfolding case study or a simulation that can go on for a long time in about four pages on a PDF or in about 10 to 12 slides on a PowerPoint deck. And I've created this level of case study as an unfolding because this is the most easily replicatable to go into your classrooms with. You know, if you are doing this paradigm of 20 minutes of lecture, you've got about 30 minutes or so of active learning. You can do this in 30 minutes in your classroom, a skinny reasoning level. And so last week, Paula Belknap shared her immunity lecture um, that was a, a kind of brought down to a concise I'm basically gonna, instead of talking about immunity and contextualizing that with an HIV patient, I wanted to go kind of more broad and talk about the number one problem that's killing patients in our country due to faith, not only because of the problem, but because it's an easily to miss problem, sepsis. And we're gonna talk about in a patient who comes to the ER with infection in urosepsis. And so what I'm gonna do, I am going to share my screen and we're gonna go for about 10 minutes or so into this PowerPoint and share that with you. And so let me just open that up and uh, we will be on our way. And so let me just uh, open this up, go to my homepage and go to my slideshow and we will get this done. Awesome. So here's our patient. Uh, this is Joyce, 80, she's an 82 year old woman who's been feeling more fatigued the last three days and has had a fever the last 24 hours. She reports a painful burning sensation when she urinates, as well as frequency of urination the last week. Her daughter became concerned and brought her to the emergency department when she did not know what day it was. She is mentally alert with no history of confusion. While taking her bath today, she was weak and unable to get out of the tub and used her personal life alert to call for medical assistance. And so the very first question, and it's based on Tanner's model of clinical judgment, which is what information do you notice that is clinically significant? And it's an open-ended question. There's no multiple choice because you don't have multiple choice in practice. And so as we have, you know, after you've taught on a sepsis lecture or on uro, uh, genital urinary problems, you could bring this case study in. And what do you want your students to notice? Well, I would want them to notice that she's old. She's 82. That puts her at a higher risk for having an adverse complication. She's been fatigued and she's had a fever. Why is she having a fever? What does that represent? Because what's kind of the one-two dance in the early part of my case study scenarios that replicate the first two steps of Tanner's model of clinical judgment, as well as the NCSBN model, which is asking for what do you recognize and what's your analysis of these data cues? That's basically what do you notice and Tanner's what are you and what's your interpretation of that meaning? Well, you know, she's have the inflammatory response, the infection, she's got a painful burning sensation. What does that mean? Is that relevant? Absolutely. We know that's a classic for a UTI. She's also became confused, weak, unable to get up. That's new for her. 
What does that mean? And this is where we can have dialogue in the, in, in the classroom. You as a faculty are no longer the sage. Yeah, you are a sage when you present that need to know. You're that sage who's giving them what they need, not what they want. Now we're going to be the guide on the side and make it real. So we have a social history, senior apartment, retirement community where she lives. She's widowed and has two daughters who are active and involved in her life. Now, many of you are kind of maybe wondering, well, this looks like a med surge case study. My fundamental students would really, that this isn't appropriate for fundamentals um, or your advanced med surge. I have an unfolding level that's, that's relevant for our advanced med surge students. It's gonna go there. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but the bottom line is I wanna give you a different vision that you can use a med surge case study for fundamentals. I'm gonna tell you why in just a moment. So as we look at this data, they're not gonna know of, let's say if uh, your med surge students, yes, this should be right up their alley. This is really kind of geared for med surge. We can adapt it for fundamentals. Here's why. This is the next question. What is this patient Joyce experiencing or feeling right now in this situation? And what can you do to engage yourself with this patient and show that they matter to you as a person? I incorporated caring and questions that really get to the heart of holistic care. Now, do we not teach fundamental students the importance of holistic care and the art of nursing? Absolutely. Remember the paradigm shift that Dr. Benner said we need to, to embrace, contextualize your content. We can contextualize holistic care by getting them to empathize. This is an elderly woman. She's independent. She lives alone, high functioning. But now there's this change. She's in the ER. She's sick. What is she feeling? How can you show that you, how can you as a nurse communicate caring to Joyce? That's a great discussion. Let's take some time and let's go deep on holistic care. Let's lay a foundation in our students who struggle, let's be honest, they struggle with holistic and, and caring, some of them do. We can talk about it in the case study. Now we have vital signs. Now, are vital signs vital? And in the essence of that, would a fundamental student know about taking vital signs? Absolutely. And this is again for a basic med situation. Look at our vital signs. Our temp is 101.8, our pulse is 110, our rate is 22. Blood pressure, 102 over 50, 98% SATs on room air, and she's got right flank pain, 5 over 10. We pause and we, again, reflect, just like a nurse does in practice, as you collect data bit by bit, sequence by sequence, we ask, what do you notice that is clinically relevant and what does this data mean? What's your interpretation? Well, we can see as expert nurses, we can all see the red flags. Can we not? Boy, her temp is too high, her pulse is too high, her rate is too high, her blood pressure is a little soft, right flank pain could be a pyelonephritis. Your, your students who are really on top of their game and came to class prepared could put a UTI and right flank pain together. And again, kudos to them. But again, you know, your fundamental students, let's talk about the inflammatory response. Why are they having a fever? What is that high, why are they having an elevated pulse? And we could kind of just, again, vital signs, our students are collecting them in first semester. Let's talk about these abnormalities and just bring it in very basically to sepsis. Let's talk about orthostatic vital signs. Well, she's uh, lying down and she's 110 with 102 over 50, standing 132, 92 over 42. Is, that a, is this a positive or negative? And again, you don't prompt your students you let them take the application of what they learned and what they can apply. And again, you might be surprised what they've forgotten all too quickly. But again, this is classic positive orthostatic findings that heart rate's gone up by greater than 20 and the blood pressure has softened by 10 or more on the systolic side. She's volume depleted. Uh, that's a, that's a, and you know, we can talk about one of the things that I would do if I was teaching this in the classroom, I would get my whiteboard, my marker and put CO equals SV times HR and talk about that principle of pathophysiology that they all have had or will have hopefully soon. 
and make it real that that elevated heart rate is a compensatory response to maintain cardiac output. That's why we have an orthostatic finding. You see, we want our students to know the why, the rationale, but again, we don't tell them. We as faculty need to pull it out of their brains because they've had this information and we wanna bring that to them. And so now we unfold with the next thing that a nurse does, which is now gonna do the head to toe. And so now we're gonna do a brief assessment and I just want you to look at this. I'm not going to read it all, but I want you to focus on the, the uh, uh, her breath sounds are clear. Her neuro assessment is times two only, just oriented to date and place. And, you know, she's got the flank pain. So really nothing new that we've already collected to this point. So we just have to kind of keep watching that. But now we have lab values. Now, do our fundamental students, have they had... Uh, in essence, basic um, um, fluids and electrolytes. Can we talk about lab values and what they mean and now contextualizing fluids and electrolytes? Absolutely. Basic med surge. And again, what I want you to notice, like if we were to look at, for example, on the basic metabolic panel, look at the creatinine. Went from 1.1 to 1.5. One of the basic skills of clinical reasoning is trending what clinical data is relevant and why and trending it looking at that trend what direction is that is that a good trend or a bad trend let your students tell you don't you prompt them look at the white count it's now 13 2 it was 8.8 at her last clinic visit neutrophils 68 to 93 percent what about those pesky band cells what do they represent it's not elevated significantly but let's talk about bands as immature neutrophils that go up when a patient is septic and it's kicking out those prime time, not ready for prime time players. Then we go to the miscellaneous lab of lactate. And so now we've got the lactate of 3.2. Now let's go to back. Remember we talked about the importance of pathophysiology to everything that a nurse does? Why is the, what does lactate represent? Can your students tell you about what, you know, anaerobic metabolism? What does that generate? Lactic acid. What does that translate to in your labs? That's your lactate. A lot of nurses don't make that connection. It's important that, our, that we really contextualize our physiology, our pathophys to our lab values. And then look at our UA. Looking at, in essence, her micro white count, bacteria, you know, is this a positive or a negative UA? Well, it's obviously, you know, that those white cells that are micro is kind of your classic determinant and her last one was clearly negative and her chest X-ray is within normal limits. And so now we have to start interpreting at a deeper level. We're looking at all this data, but what problems are possible? Now, this is actually step three of the NCSBN model, or Tanner would again call this step two of interpreting. Tanner and the NCSBN model are kissing cousins. They are very, very similar. If, you're, if you understand Tanner's model of clinical judgment, and I talked about that last week, your students will be well prepared for, NC, for the next gen, and the cases integrate that as well. And so looking at, you know, generating hypotheses, is this patient have, is she got a UTI, pyelonephritis, or is she moving towards sepsis? Got three choices. Well, the next question is what's the primary problem? I think my dad is telling me we've got a potential problem because of her blood pressure softening. And if your students understand sepsis and SIRS, they'll make that connection. But that's again, got to know your patho or you don't critically think. And so then talk about step four of the NCSB model, generate those solutions. And now we're gonna talk about the medical management. And in essence, remember I talked about how in the lecture we want to basically address medical priorities. Well, now we're gonna establish an IV, a bolus, the Tylenol, ceftriaxone, after we get our blood and urine culture, she, her white count's too high, her morphine if she needs it for pain. But our, we wanna kind of then say, students, her blood pressure is 102, systolic, is morphine the best choice for pain? Let's get our students to talk about that. Let's question primary care providers sometimes. So again, I threw some ambiguity, threw some curveballs into this. And then we talk about what's the nursing priority? 
you know, when we look at all of the data now, what's really going on here? What's our priority that's going to guide our plan of care? Talk about the nurse. I would say, you know what, Nanda works here, believe it or not, fluid volume deficit. I can roll with that. Then let's build our plan of care of, vol of the fluids, the IV, et cetera. Talk about the other priorities that are present and other things that are related. And then the fourth question, what are the educational or discharge priorities? Looking ahead, what are those discharge priorities to promote health and wellness? And again, we always want to be about promoting health and wellness as nurses. Is that fundamentals? Absolutely. Patient education. You know, again, we can just talk about the principles of how do you teach a patient well? Well, you have to know your content. And so again, that we can discuss at any level. And then finally, remember, if you embrace the paradigm shift that a case study is low fidelity simulation, what do you do after a high fidelity sim? You debrief, you reflect on it, you talk about it. You do the same thing in your classroom. Say, you know, ask your students, what did you learn? What did you do well in this case? What weaknesses did you identify? How will you apply learning caring for future patients? And so we can do the same thing in our classrooms, or if we're still online, programs around the country have used the skinny reasoning as a, about a two to three hour clinical replacement activity when you add the guided, the guided reflection at the end and you have some guidance with faculty to work through it. It's about a four, a four plus hour, four to five clinical replacement activity. And hopefully by fall, we'll be back in our, class, in, our, in our clinical settings. But if not, I want you to know that faculty have found this to be a very helpful level and just wanted to share that with you and kind of would like you to think about you know, how would your, how would your students do with that? I'm back again and like to know what you thought. Did that look too difficult? Could you see fundamental students doing portions of that? Again, not the whole thing, but I want you to get a vision of bringing context to your content and what that would look like in your program. And so, you know, these resources have been used by, I've, I, I've written these for several years now, and I've gotten some very positive feedback from other educators. And even Paula last week who shared, has been using my cases for years and shared how they help them bring real life clinical situations to the class and promote active learning in her class. And all of her students have identified and has exhibited deeper learning, thinking through analysis, synthesis, evaluation, and application at the bedside. And, you know, my goal is to empower you as educators to put these innovative cases to work. And they're very unique. There's nothing like these within the, within the marketplace, uh, even with what Elsevier and others publish. And I want you to know, I've got a free case study I want to give you. It's on my website, keithrn.com, and it's a free COVID-19 skinny reasoning. It is a powerful and short exemplar for oxygenation or just talking about COVID-19. And I also, on when you sign up for the case study, you get my updates. You know, I have updates that I put up at least once a week. I'm not going to spam you with everything I've got. No, I'm not about that. But I, if you're not getting my updates for Keith RN, I've got a lot of things I'm doing and excited to share some new things coming up just to be in the loop you know, if nothing else, if you already, if you don't need the case, but you'd like, if you're not getting my updates, please do so. And, you know, I've got about 30 topics of skinny reasoning across the curriculum inside my store on Keith RN. So, you know, on KeithRN.com, you can, you can get a free one or you can purchase some individually. But my best value is my membership for nurse educators. And I've got 110 case study topics inside the membership of different levels from very short and concise called skinny to unfolding, which is about twice as long. That's really a powerful, like a high fidelity SIM in a low fidelity platform and what that looks like. And I've also got the membership available for nurse educators as individuals. And so uh, my best value by far is the departmental membership. And so I want you to know if your department is looking for innovative resources to rock active learning, not only in the online setting, if you need it, but also in the classroom. When we go back to campus, I want you to know I've got the, I've got the goods, I've got the tools that can help serve your needs. And I just want you to all know that I've got five 
$50 gift card coupons for my membership that I'm going to basically randomly assign to uh, those who have commented. So if you want to just throw something out there at the end of this, I'm going to throw you a coupon code. Uh, I got five of those and I would love to share those and have you put those to good use. And you know, in closing, you can't do transformational change alone. And you know, we all need a supportive community. I'm really thankful that you're here because I, I hope that this is helping kind of providing an essence of a supportive community to validate what you're thinking to really rock and transform the way nursing is taught because we are still in need of radical transformation. And so, you know what, I've got a Facebook group of over 5,000 supportive educators called Teachers Transforming Nursing Education. If you're not inside that community, go to Facebook. I'm not a Facebook fan. I'm a little old for that. I'm not kind of want to keep it close to the vest, but this is a powerful community of people who are supporting each other. And so, you know what, if you have a question or, or, or a comment and you want to talk to me personally, email me at keith at keithrn.com. And it's my pleasure and privilege to serve your needs. And I will get back to you within 24 hours. So in closing, I'd like to know what did you think of that case study and, um, and what that looks like. And I know that you've got some questions and I'm going to start kind of looking at the queue here. And so we're going to kind of take this slow and steady. So we're going to basically just kind of um, you know, just un un unpack some of these questions because they're very important. And uh, let me just kind of, uh, let me just kind of say, I don't want to miss anybody's comments as they look at this. Um, unfolding cases are critical. And you know, Patricia, the reason I would say unfolding cases are critical is because that's how nurses experience the content or experience patient care. It unfolds one step at a time, open-ended, that scenario what's relevant and why, pause. Vital signs, relevant and why, assessment. And that's how we want our cases. So what I want you to do is look at what you're using. Not all case studies are created equal. And we wanna use the best possible tools. I'm not saying that I've got it all, but I think I just wanna show you what I have to offer and how you can innovate your classroom using some tools. Because one of the things I've learned about educators, you don't have enough time. And it's really my pleasure to create the tools that you can see the value of. Download, boom, you got it. Um, so Tammy asked a great question. I wanna kind of show that. How do you incorporate pharmacology? And Tammy, this is really simple. I didn't really take the time with it, but when you looked at the medical management and I had those orders of the morphine and the ceftriaxone, and this is where you as an educator, you can take my case Add more information to it. If you're, if you're doing pharmacology, for example, and you want to throw out some more medications, talk about it. Do it. You know, take what I've got and make it your own. But what, I, what, 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 what the case studies have is a second column of, of, of where the students are asked, what's the rationale for the primary care provider to order it? And then the third column, what's the expected outcome? What's that drug going to do? And what I'm really wanting my students to capture with that, mech of action. That's, the, you know, when I, when I talk about rationale for those medications, mech of action, expected benefit and outcome. That's really practical thinking. And we don't need to overdo it and make it into a, you know, and if you're teaching farm, you want to add some more layers to it. Again, you ask the questions. You know, what I'm doing with the case study is giving you a buffet to kind of start with. And if you want to add to it or subtract, I want to give you that complete, give, you know, I want to give you a vision to basically kind of, you know, see how, what would you do differently? What would you add? What would you subtract? And what that looks like. And I also want you to know that all of my cases come with an answer key. So if you're not confident of the, of the correct answer, you got the student version, also got the answer key. So let's see what else we've got out there. I talked about pharmacology. Um, let's see here. Um, Let's see what else we've got here. Learning so much. Great. I'm glad you love the community, Jennifer. I love it too. I'm really proud. You know, I, I haven't been as engaged with it as I would have liked to in the last <laughs> in the last months, last year even. But as I come to a close in my PhD, says my goal is not to, 
you know, be the, the, the sage in that group. I just want to be a participant and add and subtract where I can. So I'm glad you're finding it helpful and I encourage you all to go there. Um, are we teaching? This is a great question. Let's put it on the screen. Are we teaching nursing diagnosis? I have experienced no understanding from students as lower levels are not teaching it anymore. And this is really interesting question. You know, nursing diagnosis, I would say, do what your program's doing, Deb, but in principle, it's really about what really fits the patient. And you know, this is where we need to kind of use NANDA when it fits, like fluid volume deficit. That fit beautifully in this sepsis scenario, use it. But the problem we have that we must change, in my opinion, in nursing education, is that if NANDA doesn't fit, let the students state the priority in their own words. That's clinical reasoning. What's the essence of the nursing problem or the patient problem? State it in your own words. I would kind of be leaning more to that at the second year, more advanced levels. But again, let's have that flexibility, Deb. And so that's kind of, you know, where I would kind of split the baby. And again, so we got strong feelings in both camps. Nanda, got to hold on to our language of the profession or let it go. I'm kind of pretty loose. I'm loosey-goosey on Nanda. I can let it go pretty easily. Um, so, yeah, let's see what else we have here. I'm just kind of looking here. So, um, yes. And so, you know, I just want you to know, um, as I look at these, how, let's see what, this is a good question. This is from Alice. How do you reduce TMI and infobesity for a class like community? And this class isn't patho-based. And Alice, that's a great question. And you know, other educators are asking that because it's like when you're teaching community health, leadership, those are really more ambiguous. And again, what I would say, Alice, is what I shared in the last couple of weeks, what is relevant and most important about community health, public health for first year generalist, not a public health specialist? And that's where I would just have you step back and really reflect on what's most and least important because you're, you're right, the categories of pharmacology and nursing priority and physiology don't fit. What's most important for first year generalist and then stick with that and that's really i think a guiding principle that pat benner is, would, would advocate as well as myself that it's really that deep learning of what's most important same thing i'm just saying it differently so no great question and thank you alice for sharing that all right teresa you're liking this i'm loving this too you know this is kind of fun for me i mean i got to do some studying i got to finish my terms and pass but uh, this is a nice break uh, from the monotony uh, of studying sometimes. And so, yes. Um, yeah, so Nancy, I'm glad you used the COVID case study. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, I really enjoyed writing those, by the way. I really think they're very powerful and bringing context. And yes, the urinary catheterization case scenario, Anne, I'm glad you're using that. Uh, I, you know, one of the goals that I wanted to do with some of my case studies in the membership was bring contextualization to the skills. You know, if we can teach urinary catheterization, great. But do they know when to use it? Like a post-op patient with a bladder ultrasound of 800 mLs. Can they put two and two together? I need a straight cath. This is my patient's got lower pubic pain, etc. So again, bring context to all of your skills. Don't just teach the skills. Help them then develop the thinking when to use the skill. So no, great insight. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, and, and, and I really do appreciate that. Um, yeah. And, you know, we teach nursing diagnosis and fundamentals and sin. I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. I would just say, hold it loosely because nurses in practice do not think in three-part nursing diagnostic statements. We all know that. Why do we teach it? It's part of the education practice gap. We can shrink pretty quickly by doing that. So, yeah. Um, let me just kind of scroll down here and see, make sure I'm not missing any questions. Great. I'm glad you're finding this case helpful. I'm teaching patho. Oh, this is a great question. This is from Peggy. I'll put you on the screen, Peggy. Teaching a patho course this fall, what suggestions do you have for a patho course? Um, as you look at patho, you know, Peggy, what I would really focus on is bringing context 
to your pathophysiology course. And that's where you bring in your exemplars of like, like talking about the inflammatory response, the immune system, bring in then, again, you're kind of focusing on the physiology, the pathophys, which is wonderful, but bring a context to it. You know, the principle that Pat Benner talked about in education is contextualize the content. That includes contextualizing pathophys, but you're focusing on the science of pathophys and bringing just a little context. So because you're not in the nursing program at this stage, or maybe they are, but we're teaching more patho as a priority, let's go patient light, patho heavy, but bring in the patient, bring in the exemplars that represent a, a common example of what you're teaching, whether it be the inflammatory response is a great example with sepsis and infection, COVID-19 and the immune system, you know, bring a little bit of context to the content of patho. So great question, Peggy. And, uh, and, and Bailey had a question or a statement of saying, yes, if they understand mech of action, they automatically understand side effects and nursing implications. Now, Bailey, I said that two weeks ago, but if that's your insight and you rocked it and you kind of came put that together, well done. And it's spot on. So yeah, great insights. And, uh, and yeah, and so Kathy, I'm glad your program is finding the membership helpful and putting that together. And, you know, really just You'd be surprised, you know, one of the things about case studies that are well-written that situate clinical realities, you don't need vSIM. You don't need the latest technology. I'm not against vSIM. I don't want to really come up, I don't want to play that. But the bottom line is you don't need high tech to have high learning. That's my point. You can bring it and rock it with a very salient case study. And that's really what even Pat Benner and using unfolding cases with Lisa Day's exemplar was highlighting how powerful a low tech strategy can have high learning value. So yeah, I hope you saw that and could put that together. Um, great, so Julie, I am just so encouraged. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing and taking time out of my schedule so that you're able to kind of just rock it and bring it into practice. And so I'm just so thankful that you're putting this, uh, I'd like to know, what you're going to do differently? Do you have an HIV case study or what are you going to do with immune? Because immunity is a tough concept or content, but again, giving you some ideas to rock it. Because all of you educators, we're inherently creative. That's why we do what we do. And those once we get the wheels spinning, my goal is just to kind of get them spinning. And then you just keep spinning even faster. And you know your students, you know your content, your curriculum rock it and really be blessed. So great to hear that. So thank you for sharing. Um, let's see. And so, yeah, Chelsea, you know, I, you know, I wanted to share that because, you know, fundamentals is a hard content to teach. We sometimes just narrow it down so much that we don't really, we, we don't bring in the patient. We just talk about all these concepts that are very fundamental, like therapeutic communication whatever, holistic care, and the basic kind of the skills, the soft skills, but we can contextualize it and just pull out, Chelsea, what fits with your fundamental students. And you can do that with any case study, not just what I've written, but with any contextualization and bring that context. And so um, Jamie has a question I wanted to answer. Do you have anything for testing using the NCSBN model? Um, not yet. I have some things cooking that's coming. That's all I'm gonna say. But if you get my updates, and again, just get my download my case study if you and get on my update list, you'll be first in line because I've got something coming with NCSBN and test questions that are going to replicate NGN styles. So I'm excited to share that in the days ahead. Not there yet. Um, and so you know what? Um, we have a great question here. Paula asked a great question. Um, with next generation NCLEX, is NANDA still going to be a part of it? And I would say, Paula, no. In fact, you know what? Truth be told, nursing diagnosis and NANDA statements aren't even a part of the current um, NCLEX. And that's not going to change based on what I've seen from the NCSBN. So um, bottom line is we can hold nursing diagnosis loosely for that reason alone. Um, as well as its implications to practice. So thank you for sharing that, Paula. Great to have you back uh, on the uh, on the Facebook Live. Um, and so let's see what we else have here. Um, yeah, Jamie, you kind of answered my question, so thank you for sharing that. 
Um, and let's see what else we have here. Just before we kind of wrap it up here, we've been about 50 minutes, so thank you for your patience. Um, oh, um, I'll share that question again for you, Patricia. Um, if anything is to be remembered, not everything can be taught. That's a that's I'm from Sally Kennedy, the author of the textbook of online learning in nursing and developing online courses in nursing. I love that textbook, and uh, I've had a chance to be in communication with Sally and uh, value her insights. So that's the quote. Write it down, Patricia, and incorporate that philosophy into all that you do. Um, and let's just, uh, Cindy has a good question. I want to answer that. Um, any experience incorporating transitions in nursing with the case studies or any case studies with that focus? And so when you're talking, Cindy, about transitions in nursing, are you referring to new kind of that, that the very pre-nursing level or what is that transitions to nursing referring to? I'm not quite sure I, I'm clear. Um, if you'd like an answer, just email me at Keith at KeithRN.com. I'll be glad to help you and answer that question for you. And so let's see here. Um, wonderful. Well, Becky, I'm glad you're finding this helpful. And I, you know, it's my pleasure to share, you know, the things that I've been that I've learned in my journey with other educators who kind of recognize the value and the insights. And it just really makes sense. And I hope that you're seeing that and able to put it all together. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, oh, let me see if there's anything else here. I'm just kind of um, going to wrap it up here soon. So we we kind of, I know that you're all very busy. Um, yeah, and so, you know, this is a great question from Elizabeth, that she's a new faculty teaching pharmacology, and that's a huge responsibility. How do you bring in the context when they've had no clinical experience to pull from? And you know what? That's okay. You know what? We want to introduce them to nursing, to patient care. And so we can provide that context. And again, go patient light, Elizabeth, because our focus is on pharmacology. But we want to bring in kind of a, some of the common problems. Like when you're teaching, like, for example, the antibiotics and the common infections that would treat that. When you're looking at, as, when you're looking at the different inhalers, talk about asthma. You know, and just bringing a little bit of, of physiology to make the pharmacology make sense. Because again, they're, they're both applied sciences that require an understanding of pathophysiology. And so that would just be my insight to that. And so anyways, um, just looking here, I'm just, uh, um, thanks, Cindy. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be looking for that email. And other than that, you know what? I did my best if I missed any of you. You know what, my email, Keith at KeithRN.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'll do whatever I can to help you. So I want to thank you. It's been a pleasure to bring this in next week. We're going to go deeper on sepsis. We're going to go deeper, not necessarily on sepsis. We're going to go deeper with an unfolding case study that is called unfolding reasoning that's going to basically push your advanced students to their, to their limit in a good way, in the safety of your classroom. I want to show you the distinct differences of unfolding reasoning compared to skinny, so you can kind of compare and contrast and see what would best serve the needs of your students. So you know what, it's been my pleasure. I'm so thankful you took the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me tonight. And I look forward, I'll be there next Thursday at 8 p.m. I hope to see you there. And thank you so much for watching this episode of Facebook Live on Skinny Reasoning unfolding case studies. Have a blessed week. Good night.